Okay, the, the next talk is a flash talk, and this introduction will definitely be, be short. David Hines and Tanya Jacob of the Secular Education Network are going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes um, on um, challenging religious instruction in New Zealand schools. Good morning. Um, well, Tanya and I are going to do a tag wrestling act on our talk. I'll give a, a bit of it. Uh, Tanya will fill in the middle bit, and I'll come in with the tailpiece. Uh, our story is about secularism uh, in New Zealand, or the lack of it, and it fits in neatly uh, with what Andrew was saying a minute ago about how many different ways uh, states can ignore or get, get out of secularism. And uh, in New Zealand, there's been an interesting experiment along that line, despite Andrew looking at a, a dozen or two alternatives, our, our particular weird uh, recipe is not one of them, and so I hope you'll find this a refreshing addition to that. Um, New Zealand is uh, officially a secular country, but it has been under threat from people who would like it to be a theocracy ever since it got started. And it's it's quite um, it's we are there are people who are trying to establish uh, secularity uh, as to destroy secularity by a, a a loophole in our secularity law. It's um, the first chapter of this story uh, really begins with the fact that uh, New Zealand was colonised by Europeans only in the. Um, um, 18th and 19th centuries, and so a few decades after um, America had become a secular country by adopting the, the Fourth Amendment, and a, a few decades after France had become a secular country by getting rid of its uh, religious uh, establishment, New Zealand was being um, invaded by successions of of um, Christian evangelists who had a different agenda uh, beginning in 1814 with a, an Anglican, um, Samuel Marsden, uh, coming with a group of friendly Maori uh, to New Zealand and trying to set up a, a, a Christian colony here. Uh, he, on Christmas Day 1814, preached the first Christian sermon in New Zealand uh, to an audience of, of loyal Maori who were friends of a friend of his and uh, bought up acres of, of um, land and set little villages up and set schools going, aiming to teach the Maori and, incidentally, the European settlers uh, how to become good little Christians. And his aim was basically to uh, teach... He regarded the Maori as an inferior people who needed to be turned into English people, uh, learn English, and he set up schools, and this was one of his greatest achievements, was to set up a number of schools which taught English, Christianity, uh, agriculture, um, and other tr trade-related things. So he was a community builder with good intentions, but uh, converting people all to become uh, Anglicans was another a big part of it. And he was followed by the Wesleyan missionaries, Catholic missionaries, all with similar agenda of uh, teaching uh, New Zealanders to all be Christians. Now, um, this hit a, um, a, a, a its first floor when the fact that the uh, colony was expanding its population so fast, they could not and didn't have the manpower or the wealth to set up uh, Christian schools everywhere. And the state in 1877 filled up the slack and said, we are going to have compulsory schools, it is going to be free, and it is going to be secular. Now, that was quite a, a remarkable um, piece of lawmaking in 1877, um, and it was only made possible... It was, the startling thing about it was that New Zealand at that time was about 95% Christian. Um, so how did uh, such a Christian-dominated society end up wanting secular education for their children? It was partly because the Christians were in three or four main denominations, uh, none of whom... Um, trusted the other, so they could not end up with a, a formula for a, a national uh, Christian-based education. Um, and the other was that there were quite a lot of active uh, people who, who are not Christians at all who rose to high office and had secular ideals. Uh, they included uh, one of the first premiers, um, Julius Vogel, who was a Jew, 
Um, New Zealand was a, a very tolerant society and had no objections to a, a Jew, their, their country being led by a Jew. Another was um, a, a, um, an atheist, uh, and the country had no uh, problems. With, he was rather a rationalist, was the title he used. Um, they had, uh, he was also premier for a while, and they had no problem accepting them. Uh, they were, we were secular by default. They had no, not adopted any formula for a secular society, but the education system that was being set up was explicitly, educa uh, explicitly secular. And the, even the majority of Christians accepted this because they were basically too disunited to establish a sort of theocratic form of education. So that was the foundation, one of the only really uh, foundation of secularity in New Zealand at that time. But the secularity law that they started had a, uh, a, a vicious flaw. Uh, it was added only as an afterthought uh, when they said we're going to have a... Um, um, a secular education system. And so uh, the way the law was framed, it said um, schools must be open uh, at least two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon, uh, and all the teaching shall be secular. But um, the school day at that time was actually, I think, about five hours long. So you had a, um, a spare hour to play around with when you could do basically what you liked. And so um, Christian evangelists, um, lay people, not ministers, um, would, would be invited by the local school to come and uh, take a religious instruction class um, at the beginning of the school day. Later they did it at the, in the lunch break. Because these were, these were sort of bonus times when you didn't have to be secular. And that uh, op loophole in the law uh, was not made actually legal until 1964 when uh, a, an act of parliament said that uh, this should happen uh, if the local school board uh, favours it, and it said, um, but there should be an, an opt-out clause. If um, parents don't want their kids to come to these uh, religious sessions, then they could opt them out. And so those two parts of our law um, established, uh, were basically established Christianity <laughs> in a, in a uh, backdoor way. And this... Um, there, were, there were fights for and against this, but the Christians won these fights um, every time up until um, the tide started to turn in 2013 with the, um, a, a census which showed that Christians who had been dominant in, in our country uh, all those 150-odd years uh, was no longer the biggest um, no longer had a majority of our of our population. There were about forty percent of New Zealanders at that time were um, were Christians. About forty two percent were no religion and growing fast, and the other ten percent or so were um, smaller religions. So the political base now exists to make New Zealand truly um, secular by getting rid of that um, getting rid of that anomaly and that loophole in the law. Now. Uh, the Secular Education Network, which Tanya and I are both members of, uh, we set ourselves up in, uh, we were set up by the uh, Humanists and Rationalists Association, and um, it set this organisation up so that it could involve not just people who are members of the Rationalist and Humanist Association, but religious people also could join. And it was set up as an independent um, a working group. And that group um, has been trying to get rid of the um, uh, th these religious abuses, um, which were becoming very widespread. And I'll hand over to Tanya now, who will, who will describe the mayhem uh, that has grown up in that setting. Hi. Uh, so what we're talking about is religious, religious instruction in state primary and intermediate schools. Um, some of you may be more familiar with the term Bible in schools. I usually use RI. Uh, SEN, or the Secular Education Network, which we're a part of, is a Facebook-based group dedicated to advocating against religious discrimination in public schools and supporting those parents having difficulties with it. Religious instruction happens uh, by a church, or theoretically another group, approaching a school, convincing them that, that they should allow them to come in, and arranging to fictionally close the school once a week for instruction during the normal school day. The religious group or volunteer decide what to cover with the children. The Ministry of Education has no hand in it. It's common. 
RI is in over 600 schools. 75% of schools in both Mid Canterbury and Southland have it. It can be very hard to avoid. The legal reality is that while the law allows it, any child up to 11 years of age at any state school is one decision away from having their teacher step aside and a believer take their place. It can be as simple as a new person on the Board of Trustees keen to advocate for it. But what harm does it really do, besides stopping children learning in order to preferentially promote a religion in our state schools? Unlike neutral education that a registered teacher might provide about religion, the sort of instruction that occurs in these classes is very different. For example, telling children that the Bible is an inerrant history book, that kingdom kids get to live forever, and being led in prayer. Our children start out their schooling young, unsophisticated and vulnerable to peer pressure. These volunteers co-opt the authority of the school to advance their own agenda by exploiting children's vulnerability and their natural desire for belonging and acceptance. But just as they'll encourage belief with stories, songs and lollies, some see fit to use the stick as well as the carrot. If you don't go to church every week, you'll go to hell. If your parents aren't married, they'll go to hell. Or when the RI volunteer lingered around the playground at lunchtime to call over the opted out child, the little girl, she's five or six years old, to talk to her about dying and what happens after. She was understandably upset and her parents had to pick up the pieces and deal with the ongoing sleep issues. The largest provider of RI is adamant that, these, that their volunteers never talk about hell. This has since then started exposing them. But according to parents, it is still happening and talking directly to schools, they frequently don't know who is running their program or what materials they're using, let alone what is actually said to the children. Monitoring of these fervent believers is non-existent. One school put half a dozen opted out children in a resource cupboard. We couldn't get the school for overcrowding because it was for under an hour at a time. Same school, another classroom with one child opted out, but they told the mother that her child was the only one and tried to make her feel like it was a nuisance to have her opt her child out. They made him sit on the floor in the office, essentially detention. This practice of isolating parents and telling them that no one has complained about RI before is very common. South Island and a, new, a little new entrant girl opted out of RI was made to sit outside alone in the cold for the better part of a year, hearing all the other children inside, warm, sometimes singing, before her parents found out how she was being catered for by the school. Another parent was told by a pro-RI parent to stop opposing it or they would lose an important contract at work. A conservative Christian program, Shine and Strong, separates girls and boys for RI so they can be taught Bible-focused gender roles. Now, parents have the right to opt their children out. However, schools are not obliged to tell parents that they're doing it. And we hear from parents routinely that, uh, routinely is that children are being put in without their consent. They weren't told that there was going to be a, ch a Christian program at the school, or they opted out, but their children were put in anyway and parents are often afraid to advocate for their children over this issue. A school can be run by biased boards. In fact, the Church's Education Commission encouraged this, making fair dealing with the issue impossible. The other extremely common thing is that schools don't own up to what the program actually is. Anything about the actual content is avoided. So children being taught faith is fact, being led in prayer, singing evangelical songs, and being taught derogatory messages about non-believers is glossed over. Misinformation or lack of information altogether has allowed Bible and schools to continue. If Kiwis didn't wholeheartedly despise evangelism, the Church's Education Commission wouldn't try to deny it and literally repackage their Bible and schools to avoid any association with it. But their membership who go into schools make no bones about it, and in their sermons and on their websites, it is mission to them. They are there to reach the unchurched, while conveniently assembled away from their parents. I think this is devious and a perversion of our school system. As parents, we put our trust in schools, and more than that, school is compulsory, and therefore we are forced to either submit our children to this or have them segregated by faith. This, this is a teacher's manual from the Connect 
series for five to seven year olds. It was in use until uh, quite broadly till recently. It includes telling children to mime growing strong and tall as a Christian and being choked and wilting to the floor as a non-believer. The volunteer explains the hard hearts of hearers to the, uh, of those who don't believe. Children practice memory verse, such as go to, the, uh, go to the people of all nations and make them my disciples. They're told God has given them an invitation to a great party with their name on it. He wants them and everybody to live with him forever. Then they're given examples of people who don't want to go to the party and told what a bunch of weak excuses. There's a pyramid scheme shown to children so that they can conceptualise telling people about their newfound belief with the song Tell Everyone matched up to the lesson plan. Children are encouraged to bring their pocket money along to help buy Bibles. This series is littered with examples of non-believers cast as villains or fools. It is, without a doubt, the epitome of what you'd use with children if you wanted them to go out and religiously bully and harass other children. My children were made to overhear some of this, how they weren't loved and saved and invited to a party. My son was harassed several times a week for not believing in God. And my little girl had to work to win back her friends after every Bible class because they were on edge with her for opting out. But it doesn't have to be the syllabus to bring out these sorts of sentiments and effects. This is repeated in some form or another at every school that has RI. Segregation, coercion, uh, divisive messages, bullying, anxiety-inducing doctrine, and ignoring and isolation of concerned parents, and of course, lost curriculum time. <laughs> I made a request to the Ministry of Education for information about RI complaints over a 10 year period. What it showed is that there are a lot of parents having problems with it continuously and throughout the country. It's not just a few bad schools, and it's not just a matter of needing to make sure that children are opted out properly. Out of time, okay, all right. <laughs> um, uh, really, only one final point to make. Um, we're, we have a legal case uh, against the government, and that's coming up shortly. Uh, so, yeah, if you want to know any more, we have to stand outside and you can talk to us later. Um, if I could have one minute, I'll, 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 I'll summarise... What, what is mine, my, the rest of my speech, it was about the way we began a court case uh, initially, initially, initially in 2015. Um, we were one of the, uh, we got these parents who complained about all this and got um, 25 of them to give uh, evidence uh, in our court case. The court case is uh, likely to be set within the next few weeks. Um, and I should also add that um, we have um, got non-religious people who are, uh, at least rather religious people who are supporting us. Uh, I interviewed um, a, a several dozen Jewish people who almost unanimously favour secular education. One of our members is a Buddhist who is a keen supporter of it. Um, a Hindu group are strongly in support of us. Um, a Muslim group are not that wholeheartedly in support of us, but partly support what we're doing. Um, so all this is part of the evidence that we'll be presenting to the court. And my bits that I have not yet um, mentioned, uh, in a, uh, my, my full notes are here and are on the uh, table at the back if you want to read it. And if you want to, to contribute to it, it's got our contact information and our website um, uh, where we can, you can make uh, donations to us. We've raised $60,000 so far for our case. We estimate we need about 40000 more. So um, if you'd like to uh, help fill that hole, we'd be very appreciative.